Well, here's a practical question or two. Uh, from why, why is that why T P? Uh, what if the thing I'm drawing has rarely any bend in lines, such as the top of the head uh, when drawing a portrait? How would I place a point? Uh, also, another question. You mentioned how the measuring you did was completely visual. So does this mean you didn't even use comparative measuring? You never measured with your pencil while doing this? Uh, I guess that's what uh, comparative measuring is, but... Um, that's people use, they use a stick or something and do comparisons that way. We do visual comparisons, but let's get into that second. What if the thing I'm drawing has rarely any bend in lines, such as the top of the head when drawing a portrait? How would I place a point? You know, when I think of that, you know, almost the most pure thing you think of is a circle, you know, and and uh, this supposed this story goes with a couple different artists, but apparently Giotto was going to be, um, he was being interviewed uh, for a job as a painter, <laughs> apparently he was, I think it was this, as I said, the story goes to other painters as well. I forget who tells it, if it's Vasari or who, but he says that um, when they wanted to know what his skills were like, wanted him to draw them something, he drew he drew them a perfect circle. <laughs> so <laughs> I would, I'm laughing about that because in the idea of points and uh, where is the perfect where is the point on a circle? Of course, there there's only an infinite number. <laughs> Unless the circle is damaged, you know, unless there's a bend in it, unless there's a crease in it. But that's almost the answer to your question. I mean, you don't really run into that very often, but I'm going to show you examples where I've run into it, the locations where I've run into it. And uh, in this particular portrait, uh, still, I had no trouble finding the locations of the key things. But there are so many different possibilities for points. Um, let's just look at the image. Uh, oh, this was the question. This is where the... Um, Actually, this should be further along. This is for the other question. This is for the uh, for the question about comparative. Um, let's go back one, down a little more. All right. Okay, so what we have here, both of these look blurry today. Is that my eyeballs? Or is, I hope it doesn't come out blurry to you guys. Um, and uh, let me get my laser here. So you can see in the case of the top, here, this is a very important location, and this side is an important location, and this side is an important location, and you see that they're all rounded. So I'm going to show you what different things happen in here to give me a point. And uh, uh, so you can see that this, this one here is very weak in every way. The inside reads better than the top. But I found that there was a point here behind it that I could use for getting location this way, right, visually, in the viewfinder. It wasn't, it was right of center by this margin. And I could feel the way this curve hit in relation to it, but I really relied on this curve only for the topmost point this way. This curve was just, the very top point of this is just for locating up and down. And then this thing is being used for locating left and right. And I found that enough use. Um, <clears throat> on the other side, uh, over here, we have a highlight that serves, is very close to being at the outside most point. And so the highlight itself serves as to clarify that thing. Uh, this way, slightly, but it's never great. Those things aren't great. So you have to find other things to rely on. Same thing over here. Here's this point on the side. Now, one thing you can rely on is it's the furthest point to the right, and you can get some sense of where, the, just be, by being the furthest point to the right, it has a certain character. You can identify that and just get a sense of how far that is from, you know, other points, weak as they are. But my answer to you, though, is that uh, even though they may be weak, they still have to be there, and they have to be in the right places. So what, one of the dodges is to find other things in associated in concert with that that will give you the equivalent of a point. Remember, a point is trying to hold a location both vertically and horizontally, as if you were uh, using a, um, a graph. Um, so uh, ultimately, this one here is good up to a point. If uh, I'm having the slow wanders with my laser, Mr. Producer, it goes where? There we go. So here we have a spot just to the <clears throat> right of this. Um, but you can feel through a viewfinder, you can actually feel that pretty well, that outmost point. You can feel where that lands, like at about a third or something like that. 
We don't use words. I don't use words personally. I just use that in relation to something else I can see and say, does it feel right? Um, which is the beginning of the answer to the second qu uh, question as well. <clears throat> but you can see this, this picture has a lot of points like that. You know, this one just on the edge of the hat here. Oh, I got a sleepy guy today. Come on there, little, <laughs> little blazer. I'm going to have to switch to my point, which is harder to see. On the other hand, uh, then, having said all those things, one of my primary uh, concerns would be to locate something that does have a point on it. So an exit, for example, on this bottom right edge here. Wow, right there. That exit is a very snappy point, very, very useful. Um, this point right down here, uh, top of this red pot, that I found to be a useful point. And so what I did is I found those based on the other ones or in concert with the other ones, and those became the ones that I primarily used. And uh, so you keep referring to the other ones. Are they generally right and all that sort of thing? But uh, the ones you're going to find most useful are those that actually make points uh, like we talked about at the beginning. So points like this or points like that or angles or things things meet another thing. You know, on those kinds of locations, they begin to make locations for you. And of course, in the end, this one here is the, uh, is the most prominent point. And if I thought there was a misery in it, I would have done that early and often. In other words, if I couldn't use the other ones. One thing I tell people, by the way, is to pay attention to all these locators that it relates to your frame, you know, you're looking through the viewfinder, and pay attention to your center of interest and where that lands in relation to the whole painting. Uh, and you can see that, but that, that in particular is a great spot, and you already know about those kinds of spots. But what I haven't said to you is that we can also use lost areas as, uh, as uh, locators. And an example of that is this spot right here. Just this airspace here creates a, a, or even this one right here, these begin to be locators as well. So don't be really fine in your idea of what a point is. I simply show you strong points, but it doesn't mean other things can't serve as points or eye holders. And what you're trying to do is get several things that have a, have a location, that show a bit of a location, <clears throat> and then use it uh, in relation, just watch it in relation to other things. Um, if you think, if you're always thinking pre-measuring, this this is a different kind of a game. But we're setting out and saying, in the in the case of the um, of the exits, where does this land? In the case of the top and bottom, where does everything land? You know, we're always trying to find a locator left and right to hold the ground. Uh, <laughs> in the case, in my case, I believe I was trying to locate all three of these points and the top. For the top was first of all based on this location, and it was somewhat based on this and the. Actually, I think it was based on this and this first, but that's so far apart that I eventually switched to this one. And uh, But you can see how that is, you know. Even things that come to really sharp, snappy points, they aren't really the best points if they disappear on you, like both of these do. This might be a better point. You can see it, but anything that forms a dot like that, a spot, and it's, you know, based literally something that is is a slice of nature that does that, here's a spot like that as well. Anything that does that is a placeholder for you, and you can do angles uh, with it, angles to vertical, of course, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, any kind of point will do. Anything that will make a point will do. That's that's my point. So if I took this one down below here, you can see the difficulty of locating a top place because there's no great reader here. This thing just angles right out of the picture. It's got an exit. That's useful. Uh, what mostly this is good for is this leftward point here. I can do a lot of work with that. But... What I will tell you, and what I'll show you, will show you the portrait in a second, is that a, a weak top plus a strong side will make an adequate point. Eventually, the whole ball will make a point. You know, it'll be a, it'll be a spot, and the spot needs to be the right size to the whole, all the other, to the entire length, and that sort of thing. A highlight can make some, some one, one end or the other of a highlight can make a point, or the pow most powerful part of it can make a point that you can use to relate to, but. Yeah, typically you are you you ideally find something that makes sharp points. So things like that you see here, a real bend, like you see on the left flower there, or whatever that thing is. Um, it's like a tulip thing, or even a thing like that, a negative shape that, that that making a point. Those things are the ones we're looking to make to to find useful. Some things, you know, are just good for left and right, and not much good for anything else. This one here, you can see possibly you could use this if you cut under. That maybe makes a better point, but it doesn't give you the top that you're looking for, you know, your extremes this way. 
This clearly gives you your extreme low, a highly readable place that's extreme low. Here it gives you your extreme high, which is not very readable, but with the point coming into it, it kind of becomes useful that way. And of course, this is a very good left. And over here, we don't have a great left, so we use a weak one. Um, and eventually, or whatever you find, if, you know, when you blow your eyes, whichever one you find the most useful, and then when you can actually see, <clears throat> when you observe it, that you see the, how the widths feel in relation to it. <coughs> well, that's, I'm just <laughs> getting into little details. Again, I'll show you this tarbell on the left here. Again, you can see this is very definitely a point on the top of his ear. There's definitely a point hunt here over on this on this elbow, uh, outside edge as well. And this thing definitely comes to a real ending. And so that would give you definite lengths. Points like this to other things down here would give you width. There's a point there. Uh, even the endings of these things can be chosen as points, uh, even though they're all over the place softwise. And then, of course, classically of, of uh, Tarball, notice how he actually makes his exits with power. He exits with, with he exits strong, shall we say. Goes out with a bang. <laughs> um, and then the one on the right is the start I've shown you before of my own, and that is a classic case of what happens at the top of some portraits, or not infrequently. And this is the one you're talking about. How in the heck do I call that a point, right? But it is a point, and I need that. So you're going to have to make it look like it's going to have to include enough of the left side, something or other, and enough of the top, even though it's weak, to actually deliver. And by the way, the form helps, you know, getting the lights in the right place. So the whole general impression of that spot is good, but that's what's going to deliver for you. You have to be able to do that as a point. Here's a top. There's something of a side. We'll call that a point. You should be able to use that for reference. Um, now, it's obvious down here when you get this V right here, the cast shadow hitting the shirt, that's a definite point. These things are weaker, but they're identifiable, especially if they're the only one in the room. And it should be easy, if you don't look hard into it, try to find a hard point to just let that thing float in space and see if it feels like it's in the right place. But you do have to articulate it well, even if it's not a hard edge point. So this is full of those kinds of points you're talking about that are soft. And maybe that's what you were referring to. And this is another one of those where I tell you, here you have a sharp edge, but it gets cut off by a very weak effect, but it's enough to make a very good point. Then back to these curvy points. Again, this one here, you notice how it lands. If you have a top where you feel like it's the look of nature, and that's where you want the look of nature, if, and you know where you want this to exit, just an inch from the bottom of the picture, that V there, then you know exactly where this lands, and you have something like, or one of these lands, and this one here looks like something close to half. But you don't use words like half, you just look at it and see if it feels the same. And if it doesn't, you say it should be more up or more down and move it till you actually have that same sensation as you get when you're looking at nature. So, which gets us into the second part of your question, uh, which is, um, you mentioned how the measuring you did was completely visual. So does this mean you didn't even use comparative measuring? You never measured with your pencil while doing this. And the answer to that is, I'm very pleased to say, is yes. Uh, I'm very pleased to say. I mean, it's obvious that you believe that that's crazy, or maybe it's not, it shouldn't be assumed on my part that you think it's crazy, but uh, preposterous, <laughs> surprising, <laughs> seemingly undoable. Uh, those are all kinds of words that I think of with questions like this. I never measured with my pencil while doing this. No, I never measured with a pencil. I never held up a pencil and did this, 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 you know, hold up a certain mark and do that kind of stuff. Uh, it, with Gamma, we even would fold a piece of paper, a small piece of paper, would fold it in half and then half again to have halves and quarters. And you'd check measurements with that. But I don't remember ever doing it to get halves and quarters. And so the th first message I want to give you is if your model is taking measurements first, you might have, you might be thinking uh, different, you might start thinking differently because this is a different model. This says put down the effects first and find their locations. And it says they feel, put things into the felt location. Uh, and that is because you want your eye on the canvas all the time watching the, uh, the, the play in nature and watching to see if your canvas is producing the same play. Um, I suggest to you that the pre-measuring guy never does that. He doesn't have a need for it, but he also doesn't... Uh, 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 well, he gets shut out. He gets shut out from doing it by the pre-measuring model. 
So much more than whether I, I used a pencil. I, I, by the way, I tell students to check, like I was telling you about quarters with Gamel, you know, folding a paper and showing a half to fold the fold, show halves and quarters. You know, I suggest that students do things like that. Only after they think they're really proud of themselves, they've checked their their location eight ways to Sunday by visual means, by com more comparisons. And, uh, and then when they think they're pretty dang good, then they can take one of those absolutist measurements that's, that's I, I always say, you know, do it based on something like halves, quarters, thirds, something like that. So you can see all the numbers at once when you're looking at, at nature and then see all the numbers at once when you're looking at your painting. Or better yet, go to your painting, if it was thirds, say, and measure that distance and divide it by thirds and, and, and see if your measurements are the same. I was telling uh, people in the past that I did that. I would do that typically at the end of, uh, let's go to this one, say at the end of a, a lay-in like this or this one, and I would then show them how to check their measurements. And I would show them on mine, and I would find, and repeatedly when I did this, I would find my measurements weren't off. So, so how is that possible? So, but isn't that kind of the goal? You want to be the eye, you want to be the hand, you want to be the fully informed mind that delivers information, right? And I'm telling you that you, your best shot is not to pre-measure, that's just borrowing data, but to look, to use your eyes. Eventually, the, the feelings is what we're talking about, you know? So you, say you have this exit here, and you have this blip here, and you have this point out here, maybe that V right there. If you can take, if you can get yourself to feel where this lands in that framework, and to feel where this lands in the rectangle. If you can feel it, you'll own it. But none of this stuff is a one process thing. It's you put it out there where you feel it's right and then you check it against several things. And that's the, that's the solution. I, when I was a student, I think I mentioned this before, uh, maybe last week, when Gamel said, I said, when do you stop this measuring and meaning this mechanical stuff, this pre, pre a priori mechanical measuring? And he said, the kill for measuring is more measuring. Well. If the cure for measuring is more measuring, I said to myself, as I've told you, that I'm going to outmeasure you then. But I'm not going to use one of those ridiculous devices and make myself into a weak, you know, like a, like a cripple. I'm not going to. It's like what they did to us with glasses when we were little kids. They put glasses on us and our eyes never, never developed. I mean, they just kept getting worse and worse as they would give us more, 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 more crutches for our eyes. Uh, I've read so much about eyes. I do recommend you all look into that. But the um, I guess some guy wrote a book called, uh, or in which uh, in which it was described about him that the first thing he would do when people came in to have their eyes worked on, he would break their glasses and he would teach you how to improve your eyes. Well, this is the way. This is what we're doing here. I would like to break your tools, and put you in a place where you can actually start using your eyes and watch, 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 and learn, learn, learn. You know, get a concept of things. This is where you must get a concept. You really, if you measure something, you don't have to get a concept of the proportion, do you? You just have to measure. What that? What, what? What is that then? Huh? So that's sort of the radicalness of this of this model of this of this model. But this is an all visual, all the time model, the impressionist model, and um, uh, it's it's about watching how things interplay phenomenally. You know, just as visual phenomena, you can look again at at you'll see this spot on the. Um, Am I still there with my red dot? Somewhere it's wandering around here. All right, red dot, where are you? There it is, switching pictures on me. I'm gonna give you some forbidden knowledge in a minute, let that be a foretaste. But you see the spot here, how the spot feels in relation to a rectangle, how it feels in relation to say, to say that point, let's say, and how it feels in relation to this point and this point, or this point, this point, and this point, and any number of points that it easily relates to. That's your job. Your job is to go out and find multiples of things that can correct your 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 um, first assertion, right? Remember, their first assertion is always like a pig in a poke. You know, the first assertion, the first mark, as I always said to students, is a question mark. And then what you're trying to do is you're ascertaining by by either bringing in more data or using the data you have. Um, I mean, for example, you could put this in some place; it feels pretty good. But if you are putting it in after you have all this stuff in here. And all this stuff is wrong. You're going to put this in the right place to this stuff, but you're going to have it in the wrong place to the frame. You see what I mean? So that so that would just show you right away that you need to correct to the frame and to whatever you already have in the picture, and it has to be right to both. There's no halfway place. Okay. So. All right. So let's just talk about this idea of forbidden knowledge. Remember what you're trying to do here is you're trying to get to certainty. 
Remember, we're trying to make a likeness. And so it's a funny thing to talk about the likeness. A likeness for to a student ought to be a mastery, you know, mastery of the visual stuff. But we are talking about a likeness done visually. And so that means you have to take all this visual data into consideration at all times, watching with your eyes, because all we care about is the likeness as it presents to our eyes, not by not as it is 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 told that it must be so because we've got some measurement somewhere. I wonder if you can follow that really well. In any case, here's this essay. Uh, what was this guy's name? Um, Nicholas Rescher, University of Pittsburgh. This thing is called Forbidden Knowledge and Other Essays on the Philosophy of Cognition. Cognition, I, I, I take that to be to the idea of knowing, but for sure, if you want this, by the way, ask me for it. I don't have the whole book. You can look, get that for yourself. But I have two or three pages that I can forward to you. Um, uh, but the point of it is, and I think I must have mentioned this before, but for you, if you haven't heard it, um, YTP, <coughs> uh, what you, what the skill is for us with your eyes is, is taking one piece of data, say the color of a rose, and I'll go back to that uh, picture. Say the color of this rose, and to and to verify that it's the right note. How do you verify it? Because it has to be right to this note. It has to be right to this note. It has to be right to the notes next to it. It has to be right to the green. It has to be right to all sorts of things when you're using your eyes. And so you can see that as a color note goes, you can say red, well, this is the orange or red of those two. This one is definitely purpler than that by a little bit and so on. You see what I mean? And you can feel where the range in which it lands. You can find that place. You can make a judgment and make adjustments based on that. So the first thing you do is you put down this note. And the next thing you do is look around for data to see that, it, oh, in relation to this, it should be, and sh in relation to this, it should be, and before you know it, you can't be wrong about this note. Uh, and of course, all these are in a kind of a flux for a while, and uh, but not indefinitely, and not even maybe from the beginning. At the beginning, you'll do something and you'll say, well, take on this, well, maybe it, it may be this, where you say, I can't make, that's the strongest red in this picture, and it's as like as I can make it. And you say to yourself, that'll do as an anchor. And we're going to base all of our color richness on that one. Uh, other things may come into play as you get around a bit, like you, like when you this one, the relative coolness, this one, <clears throat> in relation to that. There's, these are all factors, but you'll set something like an anchor there, and you'll begin to try to use it. And if it doesn't work out well, even the anchor could have to shift. But the anchor's got to go back to being an anchor. Once you shift it, everybody's got to shift with it. So, um, but that's what it is, is a search for knowledge. So every one of these reds has to be related to the anchor red and to all the other reds in the room. And before you know it, if you've done that, your color can't be wrong. And that's why I say so often, you know, the, really the relational truth is the truth. Nothing else, just the relational truth. The truth of the relationships is all the truth you need. And um, of course, <laughs> that's presuming that if you, if you start painting this, you pick up a, a, a color and you try to make it red, you try to get the color, but then still there are all the other things are factors. So the chroma, the value of these colors is huge, huge stuff. So the value of this red has to be right to the white, to the lightest lightest. Maybe it's this, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's this, but that value has got to be right to those guys. Never mind what it does to the reds. I says it's a value goes. And all the greens that have color and all that sort of thing, by chroma, have to be right to that one because that's the leading chroma, perhaps, in the picture. So you understand that this is what we do to get certainty. We don't go measuring reds on a stick and hold them up to something. Um, it's, it's, it, by the way, it also defies the goal, which is to find the beauty, to find the beauty with your own mind. And by doing relationals, you're going to find the beauty. That's what I keep trying to preach at, <laughs> preach at you. So, um, yeah, and so it is with, with placements as well, though. If you set up, if you say, that, let this, at this distance away from the left edge, be, my, be a fixed place, and then you say, and, my, and this one from this far from the right edge is a fixed place, so I'm going to use that as the longest measurement left to right in this picture. And this one here is going to give me grief if, if, I don't, if I don't place it just where I need it. And, uh, and so there's three givens. If you work this way, right, those are given places. This is just has to be serviceable this way. This one just has to be serviceable this way. And it's, they're always better as points, but if they still just have to have, must be serviceable this way. And then this one over here knows exactly who to be, right? He knows exactly where to go because he's got to be such and such a height, a width from here to here compared with that length from there to there. 
So if you can understand what I mean, why would you need a pencil for that? What would a pencil do? You know, do you think you have to hold up a pencil here and get that length and then lay it sideways and have it go like this? You know, just the idea of laying it sideways, your, your arm torques, your, your muscles change. Uh, even your arm angle might change when you're doing it. And you're going to find out that there are anomalies, but the, that's not even the point, even if those happened. <laughs> measuring isn't your goal. Your goal is to be free of measuring of that sort and be after the beauty of the relationships. Because in the beauty of the relationships is the beauty of the picture. And in the beauty of the relationships is the truth. So, um, and I mean in every way, spatially, and every other way. Now, when Ang talked about points and angles, he's talking about the idea of plumb, right? So, uh, at that point, it's really useful to have points, per se. Now, you could use this edge here <clears throat> as you know, just looking at that part of it, even maybe including this, and shooting that off to something down here. It could be maybe that edge, even, going into this thing. And you can see the angle of that there without points. And you can feel that whether that angle is right to vertical, right? Now, that's one of those things. Are you going to measure that with a clock? Which not, it's not harmful to use the, uh, the idea of vertical and at clocks. So you could say, oh, that looks like 2 o'clock or, or something if you set, if you set vertical here. But um, just remember, there's always, but the vertical is always the key, right? So all you have to do is learn how, and your frame is vertical if you're doing it right. Your, your panel is already vertical on both sides. So these angles are functions of vertical. And for you to learn to see them as functions of vertical and just do that over and over again, and then see them as functions of each other, watch this angle to this angle, that's the set of the, of, or even to that angle and to this angle and to all these other angles. There's several of these sets of angles that are really intriguing. The way this angle set here feels to this thing over here this stuff is a gift. This is a gift of, if you want to call it synchronicity or beauty or rhyme or something like that. But that's, that's a different way of making a likeness, isn't it? Than using measurements and sticks and turning yourself into an abject photograph, uh, you know, camera or a stenographer in the worst sense of that word. But I'm saying the word driving, we're being driven by the idea of beauty in the relationships. I know that sounds preposterous, but I don't, in any of these pictures, I've never taken, to answer your question specifically, I've never taken a uh, pencil and held it up and said, I'll get this length and then I'm going to get three of them over here or something like that. Or I've never said, here's one of these, let's see, here's one more and one more and one more. Oh, I'm just right. I've never done that. I don't do that now. I never, well, I did it with the art students, like I'm going to tell you I didn't. But I don't do that at all. I don't need to. Because I can see if I have a visual strong place that reads and looks strong, and a visual strong place here that looks strong, I can easily see where the bottom of this should go by trial and error. If you're afraid of trial and error, in other words, if you want to be spitballed over the home plate of life, you'll measure first. But if you actually want to jump in on this, you know, if you really want to swim, you know, jump in the deep end and, and, and start floating around, finding out what it takes to maneuver in these kinds of waters. You know, when you have to actually say, well, I know a fixed thing. You have to know a fixed thing. This whole painting is trying to get to a fixedness, right? But we float things out there and we project possibilities, right? And you have to work with them. You can't have 1,800 flex possibilities. You have to actually have some certainties, which is why you get at the beginning, say, a left and right or a strongest place, you know, strongest effects, those sorts of things, because we need fixedness. We need the most chromatic note. We need to know what it is and say, let's fix on that one. Let's try to, well, I would use the word key to those kinds of things. Uh, anchor is the other word. And then visually, Everything else comes into play. Then you say, well, if that's there, then, 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 you know. But that's all I can tell you is you have to learn to love to look at what's in front of you, become familiar with it as it relates to these two ideas, angles and proportions. And, um, <clears throat> and, and we're just talking about points. And I say points, I mean locations. It doesn't have to be pointy. Um, as I said in the other one, we don't only have a certain number of points. I'll go back to that previous one, this one here. This is a, unfortunately not the right angle. I was sitting over here looking at this and the angle I was viewing was what you're getting over here. But everything I did in this picture was without any kind of a, a, a ruler or, or a comparison tools, nothing like that. Um, and it, you know, I'm just simply offering you this, that if you will put yourself to work on, on learning to see, to see relationally and to articulate well the things that you're working with, that are giving you the relationships, like the, like say the point of the nose here or something, and the tip of the ear here. Learning to articulate those well at the beginning, so they look well, 
And then you can see the angle of them as it relates to vertical and as it floats in space and as it relates to other angles very nicely once you articulate it well at the beginning, two or three of these places, which is why whatever point you make, you have to make it work, even on the one with the uh, soft uh, top head. This has to become adequate enough to actually serve as a clear point. And there are so many ways to do it. Don't be put off by not having a square edged point. You know, that's just a, that is a lucky gift, right? And uh, so edges come into play as well, the relative softness and hardness. Well, that initiates you at least into the idea of how my thinking works. You see it is in Tarbell's mind as, as well, that, um, that the, uh, there's, a, there's a certain keying to locations like this, important locations like this, and like this, and certain things, right? Certain elements like this, the sharp edge here. There's certain things that make these dominant spots and the interplay of those visual is what we do and we do it by eye. We do it by maneuvering and visually uh, adjusting. That's the beauty of our start too, by the way, is that, and, 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 but you can do it in pencil. You should try doing it on brown paper and charcoal and white chalk. Try to experiment with this. You know, see if you can make these put points out there and learn how to float them. Um, as I said, in an oil painting, you can do it and move anything because you have a rag in your hand on the first day. You can move anything if you're not you're putting sticky uh, mediums into your into your thing. All right, I better get out of here. Um, I see my 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 battery is talking to me. Didn't expect that, but um, I think that's all you need for now. And uh, um, yeah, and let's let it go at that. Thank you very much for your question there, YTP, and. Um, and keep on exploring this. Get back to me some more. Uh, I do not have any problem at all trying to uh, to finesse, you know, to talk more precisely about this. And I really like this question. All right. Thank you very much. See you all in another week. I think it's going to be a week again. I think my producer is, he's in a, uh, what is it, 11 week, every single day, 12 hour days of, of, of being a, 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 he's the director of cinematography for a film that's being made. So it is a serious <laughs> It's a serious thing, a serious difficulty for him to get back and work on these things. So thank you, Mr. Producer, for your <laughs> figure this out. And uh, apologize to you guys that you only get me once a week if you get that, hopefully. All right, next time. Thank you uh, for all your donations, for your, um, for your sharing, for your, your, your um, comments. Uh, keep it all coming. It's much appreciated. Do subscribe when you can and uh, get your friends to do the same. All right. Um, thank you and next time.